All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Getting Started with In Vitro Blood Vessel Research. My name is Andy Henton and I will be your host for today's event. Our session today is sponsored by Living Systems Instrumentation and is an introduction to the essential tools and techniques that scientists need to know for studying function in isolated blood vessels using a pressurized arteriograph system. First, we will hear from Dr. Jerry Herrera, President of Catamount Research and Development and Living Systems Instrumentation. Catamount R&D is a laboratory services company specializing in preclinical research studies, and Living Systems Instrumentation designs and manufactures instruments for in vitro research studies of perfused cannulated blood vessels. Today, Jerry will be providing a brief historical overview regarding the study of isolated vessels and discussing typical system design and laboratory setup for pressurized arteriographs. Following, we will, hear, we will be joined by Dr. Scott Early, Associate Professor of Pharmacology at the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Scott has been studying vessels using these techniques for over 15 years and is going to cover the essential steps for getting started with these experiments, including tips and tricks that he has learned along the way that will ensure consistent and accurate results. Okay, thank you, Andy. And uh, I want to thank all of you for attending as well. We're really happy to have you all from all over the world joining us today. And we're uh, uh, it, it, real uh, excited about today's event, and I uh, hope it's useful for you all and that you're able to get some good information uh, and resources out of today's, today's meeting. Um, let me just start by telling you uh, a little bit about my background, uh, how I got to where I'm at, and what we do at my companies. Um, again, my name's Jerry Herrera. I'm the president of Catamount Research and Development uh, and Living Systems Instrumentation. My background is in uh, biomedical research. Uh, I actually, going back to uh, uh, as an undergraduate student, I, I studied cardiovascular physiology in Ben Walker's lab at the University of New Mexico. I think we have a few people from New Mexico joining us today, so uh, welcome. And uh, after leaving Ben's lab, uh, I wanted to learn more in vitro techniques for studying the cardiovascular physiology. So I actually came to the University of Vermont to do my PhD uh, with Dr. Mark Nelson, and I did my PhD in molecular physiology and biophysics. I actually shifted gears a little bit and, and studied uh, smooth muscle excitation contraction coupling in urinary bladder smooth muscle. Um, but I've always been very interested in cardiovascular physiology, um, and it was actually while I was at uh, the University of Vermont that I be, uh, became friends with uh, uh, someone that many of you attending may know, uh, Dr. Bill Halpern. Uh, he was a professor uh, of physiology at the University of Vermont and is one of the pioneers really of in vitro studies in the cardiovascular system. And um, it was really a great pleasure in my life to be able to know Bill for a few years. Um, Bill passed away in 2008. Um, uh, and as many of you know, he founded the company Living System Instrumentation, um, and where he would uh, innovate the instruments that he designed in the lab and actually made them into uh, systems that other people in the research community could use. Um, so it was actually uh, after I left uh, my PhD work uh, and finished, I did a, a short postdoc. I actually shifted gears and left in uh, academia and started working with a company called Met Associates. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, this side of science where I was working with engineers, uh, electrical software and mechanical engineers, and helping to design and develop research instrumentation um, and, and bring them into the lab for practical use. Um, and that led to uh, me deciding to start up a new company, Catamount Research and Development, where that was our mission, our mission to develop and, and, uh, and refine uh, biomedical research instruments. And so I really brought a basic science approach to product development uh, at, at Catamount Research and Development. Uh, we actually have an in-house laboratory, uh, animal care facility, uh, institutional animal care and use committee. We're set up to do basic science here, and we use that in our product development uh, uh, approach. Uh, so it's a very unique approach in the industry. Uh, not a lot of other companies have that kind of approach to developing instrumentation, where we really take things through from basic science all the way through development and end up with products that go out into the lab. Uh, so we're real excited about what we do here. Um, and it was through this course that I, I maintained contact with Bill Halper at Living Systems Instrumentation and um, continued to be in contact with him over the years. and. 
uh, to see if there's ways that we could work together uh, with our two companies. Um, and it was actually when he realized he was uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, um, he decided he wanted to see his company go forward um, and, 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 and continue. And so I was really happy to have an opportunity to purchase his company shortly before his death. Um, it was really sad to lose Bill, a, a mentor and friend, but I was really honored and excited to have an opportunity to keep his company and legacy going forward. And, and that's what I wanted to talk just briefly about was um, how, the, uh, uh, how we got where we are with uh, cardiovascular instrumentation. Um, here's a picture of Bill. Um, and uh, Dr. Halpern and his colleague Michael Mulvaney uh, did a study together back time. Uh, in vitro studies in vascular tissue were limited primarily to large vessels, conduit arteries, uh, and so not a lot of functional information was known uh, uh, from direct studies of, uh, of tissue from resistance arteries, those blood vessels in the body that are important for controlling vascular tone and vascular resistance. Um, so Dr. Halpern and Mulvaney worked together um, to try to address that, and they uh, uh, described a project that was published in Nature in 1976 where they recorded the first time measurements of mechanical properties of uh, vascular function from resistance blood vessels. And here's uh, the, a schematic of the instrumentation that they developed at that time. It's become known as the wire myograph, uh, where they took a small isolated segment of a resistance vessel and mounted it between two support structures. Um, and the vessel segment was held in place by two wires passed through the lumen of the vessel. And so one of the support structures was maintained fixed, while the other support structure could be attached to a force transducer. And this allowed them to measure directly the contractile forces generated by this uh, tissue derived from a resistance artery. And this is a figure from their nature paper. Uh, this is important because it's the first recordings of, of, of uh, first functional recordings of vascular function uh, from resistance blood vessels. It's a length tension curve. So we're looking at tension change as a function of length perturbations. And so these are the very first recordings of, of functional measurements uh, from resistance blood vessels. Uh, and, and this wire myograph became a very important tool that's continued to be used today all over the world for important studies in vascular function. Um, in Dr. Halpern's lab, he continued to seek a way to study blood vessels closer and closer to their physiological state. So he wanted to take the blood vessel and be able to pressurize it and study it in an isolated manner in which he could control intraluminal pressure and record changes in arterial diameter at various intravascular pressures. And that, was, uh, uh, that led to the uh, development of the first arteriograph for in vitro vessel research, uh, which uh, Dr. Halpern's group published in the early 80s. And here's a figure from uh, his initial paper showing a schematic of uh, the first pressure arteriograph. Um, and this is the vessel chamber in which the blood vessel is mounted between glass pi a, a glass pipette and held closed at the other end. So one end of the vessel is attached to a glass pipette, uh, which you could control with a pressure source. And then the other end of the vessel would be clamped shut. Uh, at this time, uh, the, uh, the arterial diameter was measured visually and optically uh, just by looking through an ocular on a microscope which had a dimensional reticle uh, inside of it. So they would manually take measurements of the arterial diameter and record those observations uh, in their notebook. Um, and this approach uh, was really important. Uh, over here in this figure from, from the early paper, uh, we see the first recordings of a myogenic response from a, uh, uh, a rat cerebral artery. And in the lower curve here, this is uh, the recording from a blood vessel that's been constricted with high potassium solution to depolarize and maximally constrict the vessel. Um, and then the upper curves show we have a passive diameter curve with the circles. Uh, so this recording was obtained from a saline solution lacking calcium in which we just see the uh, vessel's passive response to increasing transmural pressure. We see a passive dilation. Um, and then in a normal physiological saline solution, uh, we see the tracing with the, the triangles here where the vessel constricts in response to increasing in arterial uh, pressure. 
and that, that response where the vessel constricts in the face of increasing pressure has been termed the myogenic response. It's so important for in vivo function and regulating uh, blood flow in the face of changes in blood pressure. Uh, so this recording with an arteriograph was the first time that this myogenic response could be directly measured in a resistance tissue. Um, Dr. Halpern continued to design and develop instrumentation to help uh, aid their measurements. Uh, one of the innovations was automating data collection using an edge detection system. And this was published in the mid-80s uh, where they, they took their pressure arteriograph and instead of measuring the diameter manually, they, would, they attached a TV camera to their microscope and then sent the TV signal into a uh, video dimension analyzing system which has a processing circuit that allowed them to measure the wall thickness and intraluminal diameter based on the changes in the contrast of the video signal. So we see a dilated blood vessel here and the same blood vessel that's been constricted, uh, changing arterial diameter, the changing wall thickness. All of these things can be tracked with the video dimension analyzing system. And this just shows uh, a video clip. This is actually one of Dr. Halpern's recordings from his lab uh, from a rat uh, mesenteric artery that's constricted with high potassium. And you can see the dimension tracking at work here where the, uh, as the diameter constricts, uh, the wall and lumen is, is tracked with the tracking system. So a real important device that helps uh, in vitro cardiovascular studies. Now, I want to spend a couple of minutes giving you an overview of the equipment that you need to set up for isolated in vitro cardiovascular studies. And Dr. Early, who will be joining us here shortly, he's going to spend some more time talking about a lot of these components. But this is a schematic that you might find useful if you're looking to set up a system in the lab or add on a capability is in the lab. You can kind of use this schematic as a guide of what are the key points you need to consider. And this is a basic uh, arteriograph system that's set up for controlling uh, intravascular pressure. Uh, and the vast majority of applications are well served by this type of a system that allows you to control uh, the intravascular pressure in which there's no intraluminal flow. So in this case, here's the vessel chamber, which would be sitting on a microscope, and the distal end of the vessel would be closed off with a stopcock or, or simply tied shut. Um, so there would be no intraluminal flow in this application. Uh, the proximal end of the vessel is attached to your pressure transducer and a pressure control system. Now we have an automated pressure servo controller um, that you can dial in your pressure set points, but there's many ways of doing this. You can, uh, many labs simply hang a, 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 a reservoir of saline and, from the ceiling and adjust the height of the water column to regulate intravascular pressure. Uh, and there's other ways of attaching pumps and, and pressure controls to maintain intravascular pressure, but this is the basic concept. Um, so other key component, components would be a means for controlling the temperature of the preparation uh, to maintain physiological temperature. Most of the resistance vessels are very sensitive to uh, temperature and vascular tone will, will uh, change as a function of temperature. Uh, so temperature control is an important aspect. And then of course the um, uh, data acquisition hardware and software is also an important consideration, whether that's done with a video camera, uh, or, or done with uh, computer software, uh, you have to have some way of, of capturing and storing the data. And so this is your basic uh, setup for controlling uh, intravascular pressure in an isolated blood vessel, which the desire is to control intraluminal flow as well as intravascular pressure. Uh, we're not going to be talking too much about intravascular flow today, but I just wanted to talk briefly about it here uh, just to introduce uh, this is a, as a possibility um, where uh, the desire is to uh, control intravascular pressure and also have a constant or variable intraluminal flow rate. And this allows you to study things like flow-dependent dilations or flow-dependent constrictions or other responses mediated by shear stress. And so this is a schematic of the components that would be considered for setting up a system for doing constant pressure and flow, intraluminal flow control. So it's a little bit more complex. Uh, in this setup, you have the vessel chamber. And instead of closing off the distal end of the vessel, the distal end would remain open into a perfusion circuit. And you have to have a pressure transducer on the downstream end of the vessel. 
uh, in addition to a pressure transducer on the upstream side of the vessel. So you have two pressure transducers. We're recording upstream and downstream pressure. And then you, the pressure control instrument would be regulating based on the average of those two pressures. So you're co controlling the intravascular pressure. Um, and that's an important uh, aspect of the intraluminal flow setup. Um, in addition to the pressure control, uh, we also need a means for controlling flow rate. And that can be done with a peristaltic pump, uh, a syringe pump, uh, or, or there are other styles of pumps uh, that can be used to, to uh, generate intravascular flow in this type of a setup. Um, the rest of the equipment remains similar to the basic setup. You need temperature control. You also need data acquisition software and hardware, and that's all outlined here. So that's an overview. Um, hopefully these schematics will be useful to you as a, a resource. You can download the slides uh, and, and have them available offline and have these schematics to refer to uh, uh, later. So uh, finally, I just want to talk uh, a few moments about uh, the parts of a pressure arteriograph. This is a current generation arteriograph that we make here at Living Systems, and it shows uh, the different parts of, of the system. Um, so this, we'd be looking down on the, on the vessel chamber here, uh, sitting on the stage of a microscope. Uh, most times an inverted microscope would be used, and so there's an optical cover slip that allows the objective beneath the, the chamber to image the blood vessel. And the blood vessel would be mounted between these glass pipettes here. And here's a micrograph showing a uh, blood vessel uh, mounted on two glass pipettes. You can see how the vessel is, is held in place by nylon threads here uh, on either side. And then um, the chamber also allows for superfusion. So there's a fluid path that allows you to uh, superfuse your physiological buffer into the bath and pass it out the other side. Um, and so you'll also have uh, the ability to measure temperature and control the temperature in the bath to keep it as a physiological temperature. And another important design feature of the arteriograph are the micromanipulators here that allow you to position uh, and align the glass pipettes on either side. Uh, and so uh, I'm really happy to have uh, Dr. Scott early here today. Um, uh, I consider Scott a good friend and colleague. Uh, we've, we've overlapped and had a, a sort of a similar academic and educational path over the years. Um, I've really enjoyed working with Scott, um, corresponding with him. Um, Scott recently took a new position as an associate professor of pharmacology at the University of Nevada in Reno. Um, and so I'm real happy to have Scott here today. Um, taking time out of his schedule, you know, he's setting up his new lab and getting his new lab up and running. So I really appreciate him being here today. Uh, um, and uh, Scott's uh, really an outstanding investigator. Um, he does leading research in the field of local control of vascular function. He's done important studies on the role of trip channels in vascular tone, uh, local calcium signals that are important in endothelium-dependent hyperpolarizations. Most recently, uh, Scott's group published a paper in Science Signaling uh, using a multifaceted approach, including calcium imaging records of calcium entry through single trip A1 channels, to demonstrate a role for lipid peroxidation metabolites in triggering calcium entry through trip A1 channels in endothelium-dependent uh, control of our cerebral artery function. Uh, and this was put forth as a mechanism for endothelium-dependent dilations stimulated by reactive oxygen species. So really some important work. Uh, Scott, are you with us here? Yes, I'm here, Jerry. Okay, thanks. Uh, again, I appreciate you being here, and uh, All right. uh, over to you. So I just want to thank Jerry and, uh, and Andy for, uh, for their efforts and for inviting me here today. And um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be, uh, to be here working with Jerry. Uh, he's been a great friend over the years. And um, I, you know, my purpose in being here today is to kind of present you with the workflow from the perspective for this technique, for, uh, from the perspective of somebody who uses this in their lab. Um, and I use this in the, my lab on a daily basis, you know, on any given day we do isolated vessel experiments. I have uh, three experimental rigs for, uh, you know, for doing this and, you know, and I have uh, at least one or two postdocs every day is pretty much engaged in, in using this technique. So what I'm hoping to accomplish is to present you with what your workflow might be. I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer every single question you might have about, about performing this technique if you're a, an absolute beginner, but I can at least, uh, at least I hope to uh, put you off to a good start. 
So in terms of the, you know, I guess it's first, you know, the first thing to consider is what kinds of studies uh, can we do using uh, pressurized arteriograph systems. And um, so we know blood vessels are composed of, of smooth muscle cells, which kind of make up the meat of the, of the wall. And these are, these are contractile cells that, that are involved in the control of the, of the luminal diameter of the vessels. And so this, and then the, the lumen of the blood vessels is, is lined with a single layer of endothelial cells. And you can think of this kind of like a Teflon coating um, of the blood vessels. And so the endothelial cells are involved, of course, in um, produce, they have a number of factors, but in terms of uh, vascular reactivity, they're involved in producing substances that, that regulate uh, the contractility of smooth muscle cells. And, and, and most probably most uh, prominently, in, they're involved in relaxation of the smooth muscle cells. So, you, so using the pressurized arteriograph systems, we can, we can investigate the function of, of these two types of cells and how these two types of cells work together to control vascular diameter. So that, that's, that's what my presentation is going to focus on today. So now I know many of you, based on the audience polling, are really interested in, in uh, wall thickness and vascular remodeling. So we can use the, the arteriograph systems that, that we talk about to actually measure the, the changes in the wall and to measure vascular remodeling. I'm not going to talk about those techniques today, but I mean, that, that's certainly something that, that um, many of you have interest in. Okay. So what are we going to cover? So number one, we're going to cover um, basic equipment and procedures. So, you know, Jerry kind of uh, showed you the, uh, the schematically, he showed you the theory, and I'm going to show you the practice. I'm going to show you, you know, what this stuff actually looks like in a, in a working lab. So then we're going to go through some example experiments. Um, and these are, these are kind of the steps that people that come into my lab, this is how I train them in, in order to become expert on this technique. Um, we're going to talk about potassium chloride and phenylephrine-induced constriction of mouse mesenteric arteries. Mesenteric arteries are the easiest arteries to work with, and so I would suggest if you're getting started with this technique, you start there. So uh, by looking at, at uh, uh, KCL and phenylephrine-induced constriction, we can look at smooth muscle cell function. Then we'll look at acetylcholine-induced dilation of, of the mesenteric arteries. This is a way of looking at endothelial cell function. And finally, at the end, I'm just going to show one example of, of myogenic constriction. And I'm going to show you, this is sort of maybe one of the limits of, of this technique. And so I'm, we're going to talk about mouse cerebral parenchy uh, parenchymal arterioles. So these are the, the small ar arterioles that bridge um, the peel arteries on the surface of the brain with the subsurface microvasculature. And so these are, are critically important for, uh, uh, for, func uh, for vascular function in the brain. and, and uh, that it's a current area of interest in my lab. And finally, after we show these example experiments, we're going to talk about, uh, we're just going to go over a few tips and, and some troubleshooting things that you can do. Okay, so how to get started. So the first step, if you're, if you're coming in, you're starting your experimental day, the first thing you need to do is prepare the solutions. So uh, the, this just shows you uh, uh, Harry Pritchard, he's a, a new postdoc in the lab and he's, he's hard at work doing this. And so um, for the purposes of the experiments that we're going to talk about today, you'll need to prepare four solutions. And so the first solution will be this MOPS buffered saline. So this is a biologically buffered saline solution. And we use this solution for isolation of the tissues. And so we'll isolate uh, the organ, say the mesentery or the brain. Um, we'll isolate the organ into this, this solution. We'll maintain uh, the tissue in this solution until we're ready to do an experiment. And this keeps the solution stable. Uh, or I'm sorry, this keeps the, the tissue uh, stable and happy um, uh, uh, during the procedures. Um, so, you know, we'll make this and we'll, we'll put this on ice, we'll keep it cold. Um, the next solution you need is um, what we call PSS, or physiological saline solution. This is a, a bicarbonate buffered solution, and this is, you, know, you make, a, you know, maybe a couple liters of this, and this is what we use to superfuse the vessel, we use this to perfuse the vessel. This is the main solution that you'll use throughout the day. We'll also make um, a high potassium PSS. And so this is, uh, this basically we isotonically substitute potassium uh, for, for sodium chloride uh, um, in, the, in the physiological saline solution. So we try to make um, a 60 millimolar, we make a 60 millimolar uh, extracellular potassium solution. And we use this for, uh, for looking at, at KCL induced constriction of the blood vessels. And finally, you'll need a calcium-free PSS. So this is exactly the same comp composition as, as the, 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 uh, the main PSS solution, 
except for we, we, we haven't added calcium, and then we've added a calcium chelator called EGTA to remove any residual calcium. And we use this solution in order to establish the, the, uh, the passive responses of the blood vessels. These are the, uh, the way the blood vessels respond if we, we uh, remove the ability of the smooth muscle cells to constrict. The, the constriction of the smooth muscle cells is calcium dependent. If we remove calcium from the extracellular solution, the vessels can't constrict and they behave like, like uh, basically like passive, passive tubes. So we prepare all these solutions. And one thing that I want to emphasize is if you want to be successful at this technique is that you prepare all the solutions on the day of the experiment. So um, we find that in our hands that if we try to save these solutions overnight, we get stuff precipitating, we get stuff growing, and, uh, and it, it, we don't get the results that we like to have. So in my mind, I always, I, always, uh, I always tell the postdocs on a daily basis, just make your solutions fresh every day. Um, it only takes a few minutes, and, and it will you know, save you lots of trouble down the line. So there are other, um, and you can get the composition of these solutions from, from my publications. There are other ways. Sometimes people like to use HEPI's buffered uh, solutions um, for these procedures. And the, these work well in, in many people's hands. Um, the advantage is that you don't have to bubble the solutions for the physiological saline solutions because they're uh, bicarbonate based. You need to bubble with a, with a CO2 gas mixture in order to um, get the, the appropriate pH. If you don't want to do that, you can use the, these HEPI's buffered solutions. And I believe that uh, the compositions of those happy solutions will be provided to you um, um, with the materials from this webinar. So first step is to make the solutions. The second step is to isolate the blood vessels. So um, what you need in order to isolate the blood vessels is you need a good dissecting microscope shown here um, on, the, on the top panel. Um, I don't have any brand loyalties. I don't know that any, you know, any brand of microscope is better than any other brand. Um, we have two, you know, two of these microscopes in the lab. One is an Olympus and one is a Nikon. Um, the one thing I do like, though, is I do like to set up um, my, my, my dissection microscopes on, on the boom stand. So you have a nice heavy plate here, so that makes the microscope very stable, and that, that really helps me out a lot when I'm doing the fine dissection and when I'm, when I'm trying to cannulate the blood vessels. So it really doesn't matter, you know, in any particular configurations, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever works. And as long as you have a nice stable platform and you have enough working distance to uh, get your tools to where you need to have them. You also need to have some dissection tools. So you need some uh, fine tip forceps. So we, have, uh, we, we like to use these, these number five forceps. I like to use the titanium ones. Some people like to use stainless steel, matter of personal preference. Really important to keep them nice and sharp, not ding them around, keep, you know, keep the points as fine as possible. And then you also need a, a set of small scissors. These are sometimes called banana scissors or, or uh, micro, you know, micro vessel scissors. So, and um, you can obtain these from various vendors. You can get them from, uh, um, from uh, Small Instruments Incorporated or, or various vendors. Um, so once you have your tools, then you need um, some uh, dissection dishes. And these are the dishes in which um, we pin out the tissues uh, from which we isolate the blood vessels. So um, we use two sizes in the lab. We have uh, these shallow ones that are shown here, and then we have deeper ones shown here. The shallow ones we use uh, for isolation of mesenteric arteries, so, um, and I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute. And then the deeper ones we show um, for uh, isolating for, for brain, for isolating cerebral arteries, so we'll put the brain in here. Um, you can buy these um, from various vendors, or you can make them ourselves. We make them ourselves. So we. We'll buy Silgard and we'll buy glass Petri dishes, and then we just pour the Silgard to the depth that we want. Um, and you can see that these are, you know, these see a lot of use. You can see how, how the Silgard is getting, getting pretty beat up here. You also need a set of insect pins. So these are the pins that people collect butterflies or whatnot, um, used to pin down their, their insects. You can buy these from various vendors, so you'll need a set of those. And you, you, know, in, in, you know, in my case, I, buy, I bought them once, and I basically have a lifetime supply. Sometimes we use smaller dishes for uh, cleaning up the arteries, and you can see one of these here. And this is just a small 35 uh, millimeter uh, petri dish in which we pour still guard. So um, you know, when, once you once you've assembled all of that stuff, um, you can sacrifice your animals. Of course, you need to follow your um, your IACOC recommendation for humanely euthanizing the animals and for collection of the tissue, and you need to uh, deal with all of that uh, regulation up front. 
Um, after you isolate the tissues, um, you can pin them out in these dishes. So this just shows you two examples. So this shows um, a mesentery. So uh, this is a, a mesentery pinned out in a dish. So you can see how we use the insect pins to kind of stretch the tissue out just a little bit. You don't want to stretch it too much. You don't want to damage the arteries. But you want to be able to see, visualize the blood vessels so you can isolate them. So you can, you can kind of see an example like this. So it's almost like these things look like the spokes of a wheel. And so you can get in and you, you can isolate the tissue that way. This shows you the example of a brain is pinned out. So this is a mouse brain. This is the, the distal surface of the brain pinned out. So you're, you're looking down on it, looking, kind of looking down on it. This is, the, uh, this is the circle of Willis. And so you can isolate the peel arteries that come off the circle of Willis. You can quite clearly see the middle cerebral arteries coming off the circle. here. This would be the, the, like this. And then uh, uh, from here on out, we're going to focus on the mesenteric arteries. And so you can see here, this is uh, the same mesenteric prep that we were looking at earlier, but this is with the fat removed. So you need to go in and you sort of blunt dissect away all this fat. You can see this, all this fat that's coating the arteries up here. So you blunt dissect, you blunt dissect this, this stuff away. Um, obviously, you want to be gentle. You don't want to damage the blood vessels, but you do want to get them nice and clean. So you can see you, you can see how, you know, these arteries are all coated with fat, but then uh, um, you can see how we've cleaned away all the fat in these. So then the, the big thing you want to do here is that, that you, need to, uh, you need to distinguish between the arteries and the veins, right? So we want to study, most of the time we want to study arteries, although you, know, you may want to study veins as well, but you, you need to know which is which. <clears throat> and then this prep, prep is it, it, quite easy to see. You can see the arteries are these, the very the very thin vessels, the smaller vessels. So you can see how small these are. They don't have a lot of blood in them. Where's the arteries of these nice, these nice big fat, you know, kind of flaccid vessels that are, are, are full, of, full of blood. So, so after you get the fat cleaned away, then you can, you can identify the arteries and the veins, and then you can, you can cut these out. So you, you use your dissection scissors, make a couple cuts and, and pull these out, and then store these. And we use uh, uh, small vials just uh, small glass vials to store these in, until we're ready to, to do an experiment. And so on, on any given day, you might come in and you might isolate, you know, several of these, you know, quite a few of these, maybe six or eight of these just to uh, um, have them ready to go, keep them in your, in your little vial with, with some buffered saline or, or whatever, um, whatever you're storing your tissue in and just keep them. hold them on ice, and then you're, you have to mount them in the pressure myograph chamber. And um, so the where you can um, mount the vessel ties. And the way we do this in the lab is we have the, these uh, braided nylon fibers. You can buy these from various vendors. You, you unravel a, a, a piece of that, you know, maybe maybe five to ten millimeters long, maybe longer. doesn't really matter at this point. And then you, you you want to unravel these. So these things are composed of, of multiple filaments. So you want to unravel them until you have an individual filament. So then you use, you use one filament per tie. So you take, you take your filament. I do this under the microscope. I know some people that are, have, they have good enough vision and, and dexterity to do this without a microscope, but um, I think most of us have to, have to do this under the microscope. But you simply make a a very simple half hitch. This is called a half hitch. It kind of looks like a pretzel here in this picture. So you make a nice little half hitch um, using your fine tip forceps, and then uh, and then you can stick these down to you know. Usually, what we do is we put some uh, some two sided tape in a petri dish and we stick these down. And I use the I actually use the tape to actually make the tie. I find it convenient to have the uh, the string kind of stuck down a little bit. It's just a little bit easier for me to handle. It takes a little bit of practice. You know, so you, this is maybe something you do before you actually get ready to do an experiment. Maybe spend a few, you know, a few afternoons here and there just kind of practicing making ties. Kind of, it's really good for getting your hands uh, trained for, for doing this fine dissection work. So you, you make a bunch of these ties. You'll need at least four per experiment. Um, good idea to make, to make extras. So, you know, maybe sit there and make, you know, 10, 12, or, or 20 of these or so. And, just kind of have them all stuck down in your, your dish and ready to go. So after you make your ties, 
the, the next step is actually mounting the vessels in the pressure myograph. And in, in many ways, this is kind of the kind of the rate limiting step, I think, for, for a lot of us in terms of doing these experiments. It's the most, it, it, it's the most intensive um, kind of uh, hands-on technique. It takes a little bit of manual dexterity. It takes a little while to get, to get a feel for doing this. Um, so if you've got, you know, good steady hands, you know, you should be able to do this with, without much problem. But essentially what you do is you, 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 you take a vessel segment, as shown here, and you try to find a segment that, that's free of any side branches or, or, you know, anything, you know, any fat or anything like that. So a nice, a nice clean vessel segment that's sufficiently long to work with. And, um, and you, take, you, you take that vessel segment, you put it in the, in the, in the, uh, in the pressure myograph chamber, and you, you slide the end of it onto one of, your, one of your glass cannulas. So you can see the glass cannula here. So you, again, you use your fine tip forcep, you slide the vessel over, over the end of the glass cannula, and you, you just basically pull it on like a sock. It's really, um, you know, you, don't, you, want to get, you want to get enough, enough cannula in the vessel so that you have something to tie onto, but, but you also want to leave enough vessel free so it can actually constrict, and actually, so, you, um, so it can actually do its thing. So you get the vessel pulled on, you put a tie on the end of it. You can, so you take one of your ties, you kind of, um, maybe you've already, usually, I usually put the ties on the, on the cannula before I start the experiment. So they're already in place, slide it down the vessel, and then cinch it off, and you can tie it off. So you can see, see how it's done here. Um, you know, many labs use two ties. This kind of gives you, kind of gives you a backup in case you have a leak or something like that. This, this may help you out if you're just getting started. You may want to use two ties. Um, once you get once you get the the proximal end uh, cannulated and attached, um, you want to just put a little tiny bit of, of pressure on this, and you can use a syringe for this. But just you know, don't just you know cram down on it and and, and uh, you know hit it too hard. You just want to use the the most gentle pressure you you can that will actually flush the blood out of the lumen. You don't want to have any blood in the lumen here, so you put a little bit of pressure on here and you flush the blood out. Once you've done that, then it's time to cannulate the, the distal end. So you maneuver the, the vessel in place using the controls on the on the vessel chamber. So you get you 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 get this distal cannula positioned so that you can you can pull the vessel over the end and then you tie it off. Okay. So uh, when, once you get that done, then you want to uh, uh, then the next step is to transfer this chamber to your recording system. So then you actually, so you, you take the, uh, the vessel chamber out from under your, your dissection microscope and you put it on, on, um, on your recording system. So usually, again, like Jerry said, it's an inverted microscope, so you can see, you can see, uh, see what we got going on here. You can see the, uh, the vessel's cannulated here and the microscope objective is here. Um, you connect the, the inlet and the outlet superfusion systems. So you connect, you connect uh, the superfusion tubing. So you can see that there's an inlet coming here um, and then an outlet coming here. So you, you connect these up and then you connect uh, your pressure control system. So you can, you can see this is what we have here. So we're, we've, we've got one end of the vessel tied off here. And so then uh, we connected our, our pressure control system um, uh, through this port here. So you, you get it all set up here. And so then your next job is to, is to keep the vessels alive and happy. So obviously we want these these vessels to be able to constrict and do their thing, and so um, the parameters that you want to think about controlling at this point are temperature, flow rate, pH, and, and intraluminal pressure. So in terms of temperature, we do we do our experiments at, at physiologic temperature. We we uh, around 37 degrees C. You can see for this experiment, um, this is a, a a temperature monitor, so sometimes you can put a thermocouple in the bath and record the temperature if you want. You can see this experiment was being performed at, at 35 degrees C. Um, in order to warm the superfusion uh, solution to 35 degrees C, we use these, these warmer uh, uh, temperature controllers. These have these nice uh, online cartridge systems. You can actually, you can also do a counter current um, uh, approach using a, a heated water bath. Um, we use this. Uh, we use the cartridge heaters basically because they're quieter. It just uh, keeps the, the lab a little bit a little bit of white noise out of the lab. So you can see in this case we had to warm the solution up to about 48 degrees in order for it to be delivered to the chamber at a, at close to 37 degrees. 
Um, there's also, um, uh, we can also, as, a, uh, as an auxiliary system, we can use a, a temperature control that actually heats the, um, the, uh, the bath itself. So we, we use both approaches, so we'll warm the, the superfusion solution uh, to achieve uh, 37 degrees, and then we kind of keep do fine control using these temperature control system, uh, systems that, that attach to the bath. In terms of a flow rate, so, so we're superfusing the vessel. We've talked about that a little bit. And so we superfuse the vessel. We use these little master flex pumps. So you'll need, um, you'll need a master flex pump pumping the solution in. Uh, we use a flow rate of about 3 to 5 mils per minute. That's pretty typical. Um, I'm not a, actually sure where those values came from. They, they've just been in use probably since, since Bill Halpern's day. And so um, we've just continued with those practice. So keep in mind that you, if you're pumping fluid in, you've got to remove fluid from the bath. Um, you can do that if, you're, if your lab is equipped with house vacuum. You can uh, um, attach a vacuum flask uh, to, the, to the end of your chamber on, on, on the outflow side and remove it that way. Or if you don't have access to house vacuum, you can use another pump. Just keep in mind that the flow rate, you want to make sure that the, the flow rate coming out is greater than the flow rate going in. One of the worst disasters you can have is that if you overflow your chamber and you get all that salt solution down into your microscope, then you might have to pay somebody to come out and, uh, and repair and clean your microscope, and, and we like to avoid that. It's important to maintain uh, physiological pH um, if, if you um, want to keep your vessels happy. Um, we do this. We use a bicarbonate buffered solution. So uh, we, we, uh, we bubble the solution with a, a CO2 containing gas mixture. In my lab, we use um, a gas mixture that's 6% uh, CO2, 21% um, uh, oxygen, and the balance is nitrogen. So um, we use 6% CO2 because we're uh, here in Reno, we're at about 5,000 feet. Um, if you were closer to sea level, um, in order to mean physiological pH of, of 7.4, you might want to use a gas mixture that's uh, closer to 5% CO2. But uh, we um, uh, we just uh, bubble at a at a certain rate. We use these uh, these uh, stainless steel diffusers um, in order to just make sure that uh, these bicarb buffers stay at, at a pH of about 7.4. Um, if you're having you know trouble with contractility, especially if you get a lot of basal motion artifacts in your blood vessels, it's probably a pH issue. And so you'll want to monitor the pH. You want to ensure that the pH is is correct. But actually, your blood vessel is actually your best. Um, actually your best pH sensor that you can have in the system because if the, if the vessel is behaving properly, you know your, your pH is appropriate. So finally, we need to control intraluminal pressure. And the way we do this in, in my lab is that we use these uh, servo pressure controllers. So um, these are, are very nice because you can, you can dial in you know, whatever level of intraluminal pressure you have. There's a pressure monitor. There's a peristaltic pump. You can kind of see the, the corner of it up here. And it, uh, it will... Uh, basically increase, uh, it will basically um, uh, pump forward or backward in order to uh, match the pressure setting that, that, you, uh, that, that you set on, set here. So the final step that you want, to, uh, uh, you want to think about at this point is that you don't want your blood vessels to be leaky. You want to make sure that, that the, um, there are no side branches, there's no gaps between your ties and the cannulas or things like that, so you want to check your vessel for leaks. And so the way we do this is that um, we turn uh, the servo controller, we turn it from automatic mode. You can see it's on automatic mode here. We'll turn this to manual mode. So if it's on manual mode, this simply becomes a, a, a pressure. This simply uh, will just read out the pressure. This takes the pump out of the circuit. So, um, in, so then if, if this pressure begins to drop, then you know that you've got a leak. So if you, if you see that the pressure is starting to drop when you're in manual mode, you've got a leak. Um, so that means what you have to do is you have to take your vessel down off the, off the recording microscope, go in and, and uh, try to see if you can see where maybe there's a side branch or something, see where it's leaking, see if you can, uh, if you can get rid of the leak. If you can't, then you're, you're kind of stuck with uh, taking that vessel down and putting up a, an, uh, another blood vessel. Okay. So this is, uh, this is what you need to keep the vessels alive and happy. The next step, of course, is collecting the data. Uh, Jerry talked to you about the edge detection system, and so this is just kind of how, how it looks in my lab. Um, and then you need a data acquisition system. Um, you can use whatever, whatever you want. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it, uh, uh, these edge detection, the, the output is, is, is pretty easy to calibrate. 
Um, we use a, um, right here we're using a, a software called iWorks. Uh, Um, and it, it's quite compact. It fits on, you know, a single bench. And so it's kind of nice that, you know, you can cram several of these into your lab if you want in, in quite a small space. So now we'll, we'll go through some, uh, some um, example experiments. And so the, the first experiment that I, I want to talk to you about is potassium chloride induced basic constriction. And so um, the, Basically, what we do here is that we expose the vessels to elevated extracellular potassium. And so in this case, we'll increase extracellular potassium from 5 millimolar, which is physiological, to, the, to 60 millimolar. And we'll, we'll, to do this, we'll superfuse the vessel with our, our high potassium PSS. And so what we do is that we'll have a reservoir where the, where the, uh, where the pump is, is pumping out uh, PSS across and superfusing the vessel. So we'll, we'll just you know, pull the tube out of that reservoir and put it into a, a second reservoir that contains the high potassium PSS. And so one thing that's, that's really useful to do at this point is to, uh, you know, keep that outflow tube out for a little bit and introduce a, a small air bubble in, in the line. And the reason why you do that is that you can watch when that air bubble enters um, uh, the pressure myograph chamber, that's when you know the solution change occurs. And so you can put a mark on your on your data acquisition system so that you know that you've achieved solution change. So what happens when we expose the vessel to high extracellular potassium is that we collapse the potassium gradient. So we've exposed the vessel to high extracellular potassium and we, we collapse the potassium gradient. So instead of having big potassium currents coming out of the smooth muscle cells, we have small, uh, uh, we, we have a reduction in the magnitude of the potassium current. So that um, that results in depolarization of the, of the smooth muscle membrane potential uh, and that, uh, that activates voltage-gated calcium channels, so we get calcium influx and that causes uh, vasoconstriction. And so this is what it might look like on your, on your monitor screen. So you see we have a nice, nice big fat vessel here um, and then when we expose to the uh, high, pota uh, high potassium PSS, we can see we get this, this massive vasoconstriction. So this is, should be the first thing you do with your blood vessels, is that you should expose them to, to um, high potassium PSS. And if you don't get this, this big vasoconstriction effect, then, then something's gone wrong. I mean, this is a, this is a real hammer. If, you're, if your vessels don't constrict to these high concentrations of, of potassium chloride, then, then something's gone wrong. Either the tissue has been uh, not well maintained or your pH is off or, or something like that. So, so, so this is a, a good first step, but, but hopefully you, you won't, in, won't encounter any problems. So, so the, second, <clears throat> the second example experiment that I want to talk about is uh, phenylephrine-induced phenylephrine uh, concentration. And so this would be a, a phenylephrine concentration response curve. And so we know that phenylephrine is a neurotransmitter that binds to the, the type 1 adrenergic receptor or alpha-1 receptor you know, on smooth muscle cells. And so basically through a number of uh, pathways, this causes an increase in intracellular calcium, and this causes uh, smooth muscle cell contraction in, in basic constriction. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you some examples of what happens when we expose um, an isolated vessel to high, increasing concentrations of phenylephrine. So in these examples, we've started at, at 10 to the 9th molar phenylephrine. And again, this is administered in, in the superfusate. And then uh, we've, in, we've increased the concentration in a stepwise fashion from 10 to the minus 9 all the way up to, to 10 to the minus 5 molar phenylephrine. And so you can see we get this, you know, this kind of graded constriction of the blood vessel. You know, not much going on here at, at 10 to the minus 9, but we're starting to get a, quite a good constriction when we get to 10 to the minus 7. And it seems to be getting maximal somewhere between 10 to the minus 6 and, and 10 to the minus 5 molar phenylephrine. So uh, this is a, a real good you know, if you, can, if you can see this kind of response, this is a, a real good way to know that, that your blood vessels are happy, that, that you've achieved the, the proper conditions uh, within your recording chamber. Uh, just to show you what it might look like on your, on your data acquisition system, this shows you an exam, a recording of vessel diameter, shown on this axis, as a function of time as we've administered increasing concentrations of phenylephrine. So again, at 10 to the minus 9, not much going on. 
we get a little constriction at 10 to the minus 8, a better constriction at, at 10 to the minus 7, and then much bigger constrictions at, at 10 to the minus 6 and, and 10 to the minus 5. One thing I want to point out to you here, and this, this recording is, is quite in, instructive in that it shows that what, what's happened here is that we've lost contrast. So we've, because the vessel is constricted so much, we, we've had a problem um, uh, maintaining contrast and maintaining the, uh, the tracking of, of the diameter of the vessel. But what you can do is you can adjust, adjust the level and, and the position of, of, your, uh, of the tracking bars. And if you do that, you can actually recover and you can actually, um, you can actually kind of save this recording and you get a nice stable recording here. So uh, the investigator here had, had done that. They'd lost their tracking. So they, they manipulated uh, the level and, and the position of their, their recording um, uh, 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 of the detection bars in, until they actually were able to obtain the, uh, a stable diameter. So that's really important. So that's one thing that you, you need to learn to do as an investigator is, is basically how to maintain tracking in the face of, of, of Some, some of these uh, uh, phenylephrine that you allow the vessel to achieve a steady state diameter before you, you administer the second concentration. So you can see here that we've got these nice steady state responses. So this is what you want to measure. You want to measure these steady state responses. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to worry about what's going on here with some of these transient things. What you want to, what you want to focus on are these steady state responses. So as a reviewer, I review, you know, I re when I'm reviewing manuscripts, I, I, I always ask, um, I always ask authors to provide me with example traces so I can, I can make sure that they're actually looking at steady state responses. Okay, so after you, after you do this, after you do a few vessels, you get, you get these diameters, you get these measurements, you want to plot the data. And so this is, this is an example, and these are, these are just kind of made up data. We didn't actually do this experiment, but I, I sort of wanted to show you what, what you might want to, what your data might look like. And so what we plot is we, we call it percent constriction, and, and this gives you a formula for, for calculating that. And we will plot percent constriction on a log plot, on a log scale plot, as a, as a function of a phenylephrine-induced concentration. So what you want to do is do, you know, do you know, four or five vessels and then, and then plot this. And, and your data should look something like this. You should get a nice, a nice concentration response curve. And, um, you know, and if you can achieve this, then you, you have some confidence that you, that, you know, um, um, that you know how to do these experiments and that your system is working appropriately. So the, the third example I want to talk about is acetylcholine-induced relaxation. So this is a way of looking at endothelium viability. So this is a way of, of determining whether or not that through your isolation procedures that the endothelium in your vessel is, is working appropriately. And this just kind of shows you schematically what, what we're talking about. We know acetylcholine will bind to uh, muscarinic receptors on, on the endothelial cell plasma membrane and then through some, uh, uh, through some intracellular, sig uh, intracellular signaling pathways, that will cause the production of both nitric oxide and endothelium-derived hyperpolarizing factor. These two pathways will, uh, uh, will act on the underlying smooth muscle cells ultimately causing a decrease in intracellular calcium in the smooth muscle cells, and this will cause, uh, cause uh, relaxation of the smooth muscle cells and, and vasodilation. And this, is, this has become the gold standard for, for assessing intact endothelial function. So if you can get in, in, a, in a mesenteric artery, this is vascular bed dependent. Some, some vascular beds, it doesn't work as well. But in mesenteric arteries, um, you should be able to see um, a, a robust acetylcholine-induced is a dilation if the endothelium um, in your blood vessels is intact. So and this is what we're talking about. So um, this is how you would do the experiment. And so um, we're measuring baseline diameter here. So we need to we need to give the uh, we need to have some some initial tone on the blood vessel and so that so that when we administer the vaso, uh, vasodilator agent uh, it has something to work against, and so in this case, we're going to pre-constrict the vessels. We're using uh, one micromolar phenylephrine, so we, we've superfused the vessel with one micromolar phenylephrine. We've obtained a steady-state response, so the vessel is nicely constricted. And then in this case, we've administered, we've co-administered uh, uh, 10 to the minus fourth molar acetylcholine and one micromolar phenylephrine. 
And so you can see that, that uh, the acetylcholine caused, caused the blood vessel to dilate. To show you what this might look like on your, uh, on your data acquisition system, again, we have the steady state diameter here after administering phenylephrine. So this is our preconstriction. Then we administer the acetylcholine, and you see you get this very nice vasodilatory response. So then to take this a step further is that you can, uh, you can damage the endothelium. And um, oftentimes when you're thinking about endothelial function, you want to first assess a response uh, with an intact endothelium and then see how damaging the endothelium impacts that response. And so um, the way we uh, damage the endothelium in my lab is that we perfuse the vessels with air. So air uh, seems to, seems to uh, uh, disrupt the function of, of the endothelium. So we introduce about 2 mL of air um, into the perfusion of the blood vessel. And so this is, what the, this is what the blood vessel might look like under normal conditions. This is what it looks like uh, when you're perfusing the vessel with air. So you, you can see that. Um, and so then we, we just uh, we repeat the experiment that we just talked about. So we have our baseline diameter. Again, we preconstrict with phenylephrine, and then we add uh, and then we add acetylcholine and, and phenylephrine together. And so you can see here that we're still seeing a, a little bit of vasodilation um, in this blood vessel. We haven't completely removed uh, removed the effects of acetylcholine, but they're considerably blunted compared to uh, uh, the effects that we got with with the intact endothelium. So uh, then again, you go ahead and you plot the data. So uh, we show percent vasodilation, and essentially this is the percent reversal of the preconstriction. This gives you a formula for, for calculating this if you want. And uh, this is what the data might look like. So if you do, say, you know, four or five vessels, so you might want to do these with the endothelium intact, which is shown, shown plotted here. So this is percent vasodilation again on a log scale as a function of, of the acetylcholine concentration. So you get a nice concentration response curve. And then uh, you could uh, plot this in vessels in which the endothelium has been damaged. And you can see you should see a, a significant rightward shift of this curve. So you, shouldn't, you should see much less vasodilation. So if you, if you can do all of these, then you're, you're in pretty good shape you, you, um, in, in terms of uh, using this technique in order to investigate endothelial function. So the, the fourth example that I want to talk about, and um, I'll just talk about this real briefly, but this is how you might assess uh, the myogenic response. And so the example I'm going to show you are in cerebral parenchymal arterioles. And so again, these are the, uh, very small blood vessels, and so uh, this shows you a, a parenchymal arteriole that, that we were studying in the lab. Um, you can see how um, we've tied on, off, off this end, but on this end, Rather than, than cannulate the blood vessel, we merely tied it onto the, onto the cannula. That's just because these vessels are, are so tiny and so delicate uh, to work with that uh, you, you want to minimize how much you handle them. And, and as long as you can seal the vessel off, it, it's okay to do, to do something like this. So this, this vessel is, is 35 microns in diameter. So this is close to the limit, I think, of what, what you could study using this technique. So if you want to assess myogenic the myogenic response, what you simply do is, uh, this is much easier than, than the experiments we were talking about earlier, is that you, you superfuse the vessel with PSS, and then you apply the, these uh, discrete pressure steps. And we do this using the, the servo control system. And so in this example, we started the vessel off at a very low level of intraluminal pressure, five, uh, 5 millimeters of mercury, and then, and then we upped it to 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, and 140 millimeters of mercury. And so you, um, you hold, hold the vessel at each pressure until you see a, uh, basically a steady state diameter. And then you go on to this vessel at about 35 millimeters of mercury, and in spite of this, this increase in, in intraluminal pressure, we're, uh, this vessel is actually maintaining its diameter quite well. So it's generating uh, the, this, uh, uh, this distending pressure. So then after, you, after, you, um, after you've recorded the active responses, then you superfuse the vessel with, with the calcium-free PSS. And I usually do this for you know, 15 or 20 minutes and then I start the pressure response curve again. I turn the pressure back down to, 
say, uh, five millimeters of mercury, and then I start, I, I do my stepwise increases in pressure. And what you can see here is that the, this vessel is just, just dilating passively. The, is, uh, the muscle is generating very little, if any, any muscular tone. And so you can see that the diameter increases uh, um, uh, in accordance with, with the increase in intraluminal pressure. So to plot these data, we calculate myogenic tone, and it's basically the difference between the passive and the active diameter as a function of intraluminal pressure, and then you might see a response curve like this. Okay, so now we've been through four example experiments. So um, just in terms of some, some tips and pointers, um, the big thing, if you're, if you're new to this technique, the, the, um, the big thing that, that um, I can recommend is that you practice. So some people, you know, some people, if you're very, if you have very good manual dexterity, you're really good at doing this, you might learn to do this in a week or two. If you're, if you're not, you might take, you know, two or three months. Most people take about a month to get really good at this, uh, is my experience in my lab. And so what I have the people in my lab do is I do the, uh, do the, the procedures in, in experiments one through three. So potassium chloride induced constriction, phenylephrine concentration response curve, ACH induced dilation. And we do this usually using second or third order mesenteric arteries, arteries that are, you know, on the order of about 200 microns in diameter. So you do this in, until you get consistent results. And so I have a, a new postdoc in the lab, and, and that's actually what he's doing today. He's, he's doing phenylephrine concentration response curve until, until he gets good at it. So um, just, just do this using mesenteric arteries. And then once you're confident, once this is working in your hands, then move on to, to your vessel of choice, whatever, whatever you, you feel comfortable working with. Um, the other tip, work fast. You know, you want to remove the organs. So after, after the animal, after you've euthanized the animal, try to get the organs out and isolate the vessels as quickly as possible. Uh, my experience is on cerebral arteries, this is really critical. If you leave the, uh, the blood vessels on the brain too long, uh, toxins released from the from the neurons as they die seem to seem to poison the blood vessels and it, it seems to uh, reduce reactivity. So if you want to get consistent results, work fast, get the organs out, get the vessels off as, as quickly as you can. Uh, again, make your solutions fresh each day. Don't get lazy. Don't don't try to storm overnight. You'll be sorry. Um, one thing uh, we didn't talk about is um, and and this is something that's really hard to to talk about. Is one of those things that. Um, you really need to see, but um, it, it's stretching the, the, the vessel in the initial prep. So you want to apply uh, physiological level, levels of stretch to the blood vessel, but how do you do that? And um, the way we do that in my lab is that you pressurize the blood vessel, so you, you pressurize it, say, to maybe 40 millimeters of mercury. You look at it under the microscope, and what will happen is that the vessel should bend a little bit. So it should, instead of you know, being straight, it will have more of a C shape. And so what we do is that we just, we just uh, move the cannula apart in, until we remove that bend. And then we, maybe you just give it just a, a hair more stretch after that, just a, a tiny bit more. Um, and, and that seems to give you uh, consistent results. But that's one of the things that you really need to learn. You need to see this. You need to do it on a, on a daily basis. And then you, you'll get to the point where you know exactly where you need to be in order to get reproducible results. Uh, it's important if you're having problems, the first thing to do is to check your, your pH, your oxygenation, your temperature. And so you can get, you can get uh, electrodes to measure this in, in your bath. So uh, just you know, make sure you're, you're getting uh, you know, uh, consistent conditions in, in your bath. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, that, that this is a, a technique that it's better if you do it several days a week rather than just do it like one day a week here and there. Um, just devote schedule some time and, and plan on doing it two, three, four days a week until you get good at it. Um, you'll, you'll learn much faster that way. You'll, it, it's quite frustrating if you just can, uh, you know, kind of move in once in a while. Like, so so try, to, try to set aside a, a good block of time if you, if you want to learn this technique. And so then uh, I've gone over my time, so I'm just going to uh, uh, wrap it up, and uh, I, I think we'll take some questions. And thank you very much for, uh, for your patience and for listening to me today. Thanks, Scott. That was a great overview. And, um, yeah, we've had a, a bunch of responses from the audience, many of which have said, you know, just uh, the content in, in your section has perhaps answered some of their questions that they had coming into this event already. So that's great. Um,
And yeah, we are running a little bit late, but uh, again, there's uh, an opportunity here for a short Q&A, so we're going to move forward with just a few questions, um, taking into consideration the time that we ask people to block off. But uh, So if you do need to rush on to something else, just remember, this is being recorded. You will have access to it later. And all of the questions that have come in, because we will not get to all of them, will um, be answered by our presenters and then prepared in a summary report, which you can download later. So um, I'll just uh, check if we also have Jerry on the line. Jerry, you're there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Andy. Perfect, Thanks, perfect. Scott. All right, so yeah, let me um, fire the first question at you guys. So we've had a few uh, questions come in about um, basically microscope, what objective should be used, how best to visualize the artery, and also whether an upright microscope can be uh, used. So can you guys clarify that? Yeah, I can start uh, uh, with a little bit of perspective. Um, most people find it, uh, uh, and, uh, regarding the microscope, uh, an upright microscope can be used, uh, but it's generally preferable to use an inverted microscope because a lot of times you're going to want to have some additional accessories, like maybe a pH meter or an uh, electrode if you're doing intracellular uh, membrane potential recordings, uh, uh, oxygen electrodes. You might have some accessories that you want to have uh, in the bath. Uh, and so you want to have that extra room above the chamber to be working with, and so most people find it's preferable to use an inverted scope for that reason. Um, so as far as objectives and powers, uh, 10x is a good objective lens to have. Um, most of the microscopes available will come with a range of, ex of, of, of um, objective lenses, um, but 10x is a good one to have. Uh, for smaller vessels, 20x. Um, Maybe for the stuff Scott's doing, you'd want to go up to a 40x with those uh, um, cerebral uh, arterioles at 30 microns. But you know, generally, a 10x or a 20x is probably where most people are going to be at. Yeah, yeah I would agree with Jerry on that. Um, he, uh, our, our scopes are, t are equipped with 10 and 20x, and you know, every once in a while, we'll go to a 40 for the for the uh, really challenging experiments. And uh, we've never used an inverted microscope, or I'm sorry, an upright microscope. Um, all of our all of our scopes are are inverted. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, another one where we've we've had a variety of different questions come in, maybe with specific points, which we'll address in the Q and A summary. But in general, can you guys speak to the kind of high and low range as far as what size blood vessels um, you can work with in a pressure arteriograph? Yeah, again, um, I, we certainly hear uh, uh, down to, as Scott mentioned, 30, 35 microns, 40 microns. That's pushing the lower limit of, of, of what is generally uh, possible, um, all the way up to 300 microns. Um, I would say most applications are probably between 1 and 200 microns for the blood vessel size. Um, certainly based on the, di the diameter of the blood vessel, that's going to dictate the cannula diameter that you're working with. So you just want to make sure you have appropriately sized cannula to match the blood vessel diameter that you're working with. I would agree with, with Jerry on that. Okay. Perfect. Uh, um, all right. And then I guess on the low end, or a question relating to, you know, very small, working with very small vessels. Um, Someone has asked, are there any tricks to cannulate brain vessels, such as the middle cerebral artery or basilar? Um, they're finding that they always have side branches and it's very difficult for them to work with this particular um, vessel. Do you have any specific uh, suggestions? Yeah, well, I mean, like, all I can say is, yeah, I agree, because it's, uh, <laughs> it, it is, I mean, it is challenging and that is one of the things. We don't use middle cerebral arteries very often for that reason, that they tend to be, they tend to be branchier. So we'll okay. use the, the cerebellar arteries, the superior cerebellar artery, and then we'll use the posterior, the, it's called the third branch of the posterior cerebral artery. So we, we tend to be able to isolate segments that are, um, that are of sufficient length to allow cannulation without side branches. Without that, there are some, if you go to the very distal portion of the, uh, um, the very distal portion of, of the middle cerebral artery, um, sometimes you can find uh, um, uh, segments that are long enough to cannulate. But yeah, that, that is very challenging, and I mean, that's something that that we go through every day, but it, but it's possible. You know, you just need to be patient and look look for the uh, appropriate vessel segments. Yeah. Okay. 
I would just add to uh, with the branchy vessels. If you really, if 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 that's the vessel you need to study, um, it is possible to, uh, although tedious, <laughs> to isolate branches with ligatures. Um, it does require a lot of extra um, effort in the mounting process. But but uh, but some people do take the extra time to to ligate side branches uh, on those branchy vessels. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, there were also a number of questions that talked about, you know, specific techniques during the isolation phase of a vessel and then how long it can be stored in a buffer. Scott, you mentioned um, you guys store these and um, perhaps you can provide a little bit more detail about uh, the type of buffer, maybe the temperature, the composition so that, um, you know, these samples stay intact and viable for your experiments moving forward. Yeah, I mean, we we use uh, we use this MOPS buffered saline solution, and again, if you know, you can look at my papers and get the composition. But this is a solution that contains. Uh, we put some some albumin in uh, in in the solution to help uh, stabilize the, the vessels. It's got glucose and pyruvate and things like that. Um, it's it's pH. It's a biological buffer, so it's pH at at seven point four, so you don't have to bubble it, which is convenient. And then uh, we uh, you know we'll isolate. Uh, a set of vessels and we'll store them on ice in that solution and probably you know maybe six to eight hours you know usually that's the you know the, the, a typical experimental day uh, I wouldn't go too much longer than that I mean some people talk about you know holding them overnight and things like that but I would worry about uh, about loss of viability so, so typically if you the workflow is you come in in the morning make the solutions uh, um, isolate the, the vessels and, and just store you know, a set of vessels on ice for, say, six or eight hours, and that's usually enough to, to last you through the day. Okay. Very good. Um, all right, guys. Well, in the interest of time, uh, we have a ton of questions that have come in. So for all the audience that's still with us, thank you for uh, submitting questions, for staying, you know, the extra length uh, uh, during today's webinar. But I'm going to suggest that we close things off. And, um, and again, just for everyone that's online, uh, all the questions that have come in, these are going to be, um, you know, reviewed by our presenters and answers will be put together in a summary report. The slides from today, uh, as, as, as well as an appendix on some of the, the buffer recipes that were discussed, they're all going to be available for download, as well as the full recording. So um, at this point, yeah, I'd like to officially um, uh, thank Living Systems in, uh, Instrumentation um, Drs. Jerry Herrera and Scott Early for your contributions today. This was an excellent event and our audience has um, confirmed that with all the feedback. So uh, many thanks to you and um, we hope to have everybody back uh, on a future event soon.